Welcome. Here's a little curiosity that many people observe from a calculus class when you study the volumes and surface areas of spheres. Um, we all know that the volume of a sphere, at least uh, we can prove this in calculus finally, is 4 thirds pi r cubed. Uh, we can also work at the surface area of the sphere and it turns out to be 4 pi r squared. Not all calculus courses actually uh, go through that derivation with kids, but it's actually not too hard to go to get there as well. Okay, great. But what a lot of people notice about these two forms, they're actually kind of curious. Um, obviously, I'm thinking of r as a variable here, so I've written everything in terms of r. Look at the derivative of the volume formula with respect to r. dv dr is going to be, derivative of this guy is 4 thirds pi is going along for the ride, times the derivative of r cubed is 3 r squared, 3 is cancel, is 4 pi r squared. Looks like we've just got that the derivative of volume is actually surface area. And people notice that and think, it's actually, could that be coincidental, or is that just uh, something odd that's just curious, just true for spheres? In fact, if you go down a level, let's go to uh, two dimensions, if you look at the area of a circle, pi r squared, and its circumference, 2 pi r, at this lower dimensional level, actually the same thing's happening. The derivative of the area is the object next, is, is the next level down, circumference. All right, so I want to talk about this. I want to explain why would the derivative of volume be surface area, or two-dimensional version, the derivative area would be circumference, and generalize it, and show how that then leads to a little curiosity that I would call a paradox. We actually solved the paradox pretty quick. It's not, this is not a, a deep mathematical idea, but at first it's confusing, a little alarming, so it's, so it's worth thinking about. But then I want to get to a real issue that that's always throws, throws me, if you actually think about it, there's something deep to think about what we do teach students in a standard course. Okay, first of all, let's get to this derivative of volume, at least for a sphere, being surface area. All right, so I'm going to go back to basics. Now, I don't know what to do in calculus, so I often just go back to basics. So what is derivative mean? So the derivative of volume with respect to r would be the limit as h goes to 0, of the volume at the radius plus a little bit more, minus the volume at radius r, all divided by the difference of those two radius, radii h. All right, so what I'd like to do is just Go through an intuitive argument first. Can I get a feel for what's really going on here? I mean, v r plus h is the volume of a sphere of radius r plus h, and I'm taking away from the volume of a sphere of radius r. All right, well, let me draw those. So let's start by drawing a sphere of radius r. Here's a sphere of radius r. And it goes out to r. And then I've also got a volume of sphere of radius r plus a little bit more, r plus h. So it's going to be sort of an outer sphere, like this. So it's r plus an extra h. So if I take the difference of these two volumes, what I'm really doing here is, the, is like a little shell. Now, this looks like a 2D picture. It actually means to be 3D. It's like a little layer that's h thick going all over the inner sphere. So I've really got this sort of a shell. This is the volume of a shell. This, this top line, v r plus h minus v of r, is the volume of this green, messy shell. All right, can I sort of get a sense of what that volume is? Well, what I've really done is I've smeared the entire surface area of that inner sphere radius r by some goo of thickness h. Well, if you think about it, you know, I've got all this goo of thickness h everywhere, all over the surface area. What's the volume of that goo? Well, it's how much area I've got times its height, h. So this top line is actually surface area of the sphere times h. So if I continue this work, this will be the limit as h goes to 0 of the surface area times h. That's the geometric interpretation of the numerator divided by h. Amazingly, the h's cancel, take the limit as h to the 0, well, there's nothing going on, it is just the surface area. Voila. The volume of, due to the volume of the sphere, with respect to r, is surface area. Basically because when I take the difference of two volumes, I'm doing a little smearing over a surface area. All right. This feels good, this feels right, it feels intuitively fine. However, I'm not convinced. Actually, I don't know if I believe in this formula. And let me show you why I don't believe in it. I'm going to actually go back to basics and do the actual grungy calculus and uh, grungy algebra. All right, so let's go back to this definition of the volume, derivative, derivative of volume, volume. Excuse me. This is carrying on. The limit is h goes to zero. I've got this guy. It's four thirds pi r plus cubed h minus four thirds pi r cubed all over h. I'm just going to do this brute force. I'm not going to think about it. I'm just going to be an automaton and just do this. The limit is h squared to 0, common factor of 4 thirds pi, um, and then I'll have an r plus cubed, r plus h cubed. Okay, that's r cubed plus 3r h squared plus 3r squared h plus h cubed minus r cubed. r cubes cancel, oh, and all divided by h. 
All right, running out of room, bad ball technique. The modulus h goes to zero. Okay, uh, four thirds pi of three r h squared. Threes would cancel. It gives me four pi r squared uh, r h squared plus uh, four thirds uh, four pi r squared h plus uh, four thirds pi h cubed. Four thirds pi h cubed all over h. Alright, uh, h is cancelled, I'm running out of board room, so let me just be bad. h makes this, uh, the h squared becomes an h. This um, h here cancels, and this h cubed becomes an h squared. Ah, 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 actually I should pause before I do that. Notice what we've got here. That middle term is my surface area times h. That's what I said was the volume of the shell, but it's wrong. The volume of that shell is indeed surface area times h, plus some error terms. And we lucked out. When I divide by h, these error terms have an h squared in it and an h in it, so they still go to they go to zero. Even upon dividing by h, these error terms we lucked out happen to go to zero, and we are indeed left with surface area times h divided by h. And we do get the surface area. So this was an approximation, and we were lucky that the the error terms in that approximation went to zero as we did this derivative. So actually, in some sense, my intuitive argument was fine but there was some delicate thought to be had there. All right, so so that's fine, that's great. So let's let's do this for other shapes. There's nothing special about spheres here, actually. You can imagine doing um, other shapes. If you did a difference of volumes, it's really gonna be the difference of shells between two um, surfaces, um, in which case the, the difference of volume is basically gonna be the surface area of the inner, sh inner shape uh, times the thickness h, and then you do a divide by h to take the limit. This must be true all the way along. So let's try other types of spheres. And my favorite other type of sphere is a cube. So let's do the same thing for a cube. All should be fine and dandy. And here comes our paradox, as you can probably guess. All right, so let me draw a cube. Bingo. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Here's a lovely cube. Let's call the side length x, x, and in one x. We know the volume here is x cubed. All right. Now, if I took the derivative, oh, I guess I'm using x's here. Um, if I take the derivative of this guy with respect to x, our work has now shown this should be surface area. All right, grand. The trouble is, the derivative of, of this guy with respect to x is 3x squared. And what's the surface area of a, of a cube? Well, there's one face of x squared, another face of x squared, th three, four, five, six faces of x squared. This area here is 6x squared. Ooh, a mismatch. This is not working. What's going on? All right, well, there's my little paradox. It's not a very exciting paradox. I'll give you a moment to think about it, because in, in, well, you can pause. But, but in just seconds, I'm going to give away what's really going on. All right, here goes. Those seconds are now up. All right, the trouble is there was some difference between what is r and what is x. When I do the derivative formula, I want the limit as h goes to 0, the volume, in this case, x plus h, minus the volume of x all over h. If I just think about what it is, I want the volume at x, okay, that's this black picture, and I want this volume at x plus h, and it looks like I've centered all my x's from this growth point here. So x plus h will be out here. Here's x plus h, and there's going to be another x plus h. What I'm really doing, I don't know if I can draw this well, is only doing surface area on from this face, from this face, and from the back face. How I've set things up, x is growing from this corner, and in which case, what I'm really doing here, if I look at this guy, this is half the surface area. And yes, its thickness is h, so it's probably going to be half the surface area divided by h, limit is h goes to zero, half the surface area. So actually, if I think of it this way, what is the derivative of the volume of the cube? If I think about it, it should be half the surface area. And look, we got half the surface area. There is indeed half. If you want to think about it the other way, you can do this correctly. Um, if you really go back to cubes and think of radius, let's just see that the my thinking is actually correct. This time, let's think of cubes drawn this way. Boom, 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 boom. Here's my cube. And the analog of a radius would be some line like this. Here's the center of the cube, go up, and I'll call that I would now call that x. I claim this formula should now be working. 
because if I do a little x plus h, I'm getting the whole surface area of this cube. And in which case, do the volume should be the difference of surface, should be um, surface area times h divided by h, and off we go. Well, let's check. What is the volume if I'm measuring radius this way? Well, what's the side length of the cube? It's 2x. So here's the volume is going to be 2x cubed, so it's really 8x cubed. What's the surface area? Well, the surface area one of, is 6 of these guys. It's 6 of 2x squared, which is uh, uh, 6 times 4 is 24x squared. And look, is the derivative volume again surface area? Whoops, that's an 8. Yep. Uh, 8 times 3x squared is indeed 24x squared. This form is correct. So you just have to think your way through that a little bit. All right. Now, now, next question. Is this actually, uh, I, I guess that means all the error terms involved when I said that uh, uh, the shell is really just surface area times h must be all vanishing as h goes to 0. And that is worrisome in some actual sections of calculus. So here's my real question for you. Let me go back to a very standard topic. So instead of doing derivatives, let's do integrals. And people talk about solids of revolution all the time in calculus as an application integral. Suppose I have some curve, I don't know, y equals f of x. And I'm going to take a section of it twixt a and b. And I'm going to revolve that around the y-axis because, you know, what else do people do with sections of curve? So it'll give me some strange looking shape, which I'm going to have a very hard time drawing right now. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Well, I've totally lost it. But here's my original curve, y equals f of x. All right, so one people say a good way to approximate the volume of this thing is to take a little section at some position x and do a little like, width of some kind and revolve this guy around, woo, wee, and they'll make some sort of annulus, well, three-dimensional annulus, like a little uh, shell, well, a cylindrical shell. This is called the shell method. Ha, ha, ha. It all makes sense if I actually think about what I'm saying as I, as I talk and type. All right, so the volume of this guy is going to be built up a whole lot of these guys add up together. And each of those is basically a radius x. If I come up for the origin, I'm going out to just the point x. Um, let's call that delta x. Most people call this thing delta x rather than h's. So I'll do that here. So thickness is delta x. And what's the height of this thing? Well, the height of this thing is basically the height of the function, f of x. All right, so the volume of this guy should be adding up all these shells and taking the limiters as the as the delta x goes to zero. And the standard notation for this is a, a summation of stuff stretched out to the limit. And I'm with this shell, so the volume of the shell um, with all the widths going to zero. So the question is, I need to figure out the volume of the shell. All right. Well, what you do is you say, get out a pair of scissors and cut this thing. You know, get it as like measure it being dough or something. Cut along this line and unroll it and make it into a really like a sheet of puff pastry. So think of this was a piece of sheet of puff pastry that got rolled into a cylinder. Now think of it as a as a rectangular piece of puff pastry. Alright, so now its height is still f of x. That's this length here. Um, its thickness is still delta x, that's this length here. And the question is how long is this? Well, that's this uh, really bad diagram. That's the length of this inner part here, which is a circle of radius x. So it must be the circumference of circle, 2 pi r, but in this case I'm talking about x's, 2 pi x. So the volume of the shell is actually just the volume of this box, 2 pi x times the height times the width. So take the limit as, as this, these delta x's go to 0. That means the volume of the solid of revolution is the integral from a to b of 2 pi x f of x dx. And many a calculus course has kids memorize this formula and do a thousand problems revolving things around axes doing this. The trouble is, here's my trouble, here's my question for you guys. I'm afraid the volume of this guy, this, this uh, cylindrical shell, and the volume of this guy, this rectangular box, do not equal. There's actually errors involved. Now with derivatives, we saw that those errors went to zero as we took the limit as h goes to zero. I'm worried about the errors in this case because we're not taking derivatives anymore, we're adding things up. So there's going to be errors here and those errors get added. We're accumulating those errors. So it seems to me that this formula probably has errors in it and it's not correct. So then why does every calculus professor like me and every textbook author, 
I guess like me, um, still uses this formula nonetheless. There's got to be something going on with those errors where it's actually valid to still say this approximation is meaningful when you take an integral. So I'm going to leave that as my mystery for you. Maybe what you want to do is work out the true volume of this guy, see what the true formula should be in there, and then see, well, actually, the, the extra error stuff is really not part. This is going to have some sort of, I don't know, I guess it has to add up to zero, whatever that means. See it out. Check it out. See if you can resolve this paradox for yourself. Question this formula, because it has some error in it, maybe. All right. Thanks very much. A good mystery to end off with.